All right, guys, uh, welcome back. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, please excuse the few road bumps we're probably going to experience. Um, as you can see, I'm currently holding a microphone. I don't usually do this, but that's because we're recording. Um, so one of the really cool things we have going for us this semester is we are starting our own archive. So um, you know, 10 years from now, when our organization is still going strong, we're going to have a library of over 200 videos of us teaching, uh, teaching our you know, fellow classmates about security. So we're going to have our own library. I mean, this is, this is a really cool thing. Um, but again, there's probably going to be some technical difficulties uh, getting adjusted to it. So um, welcome back. I have a few announcements. Um, and then I'll, I'll hand it off for anybody else that would like to make announcements. Um, so Steve Wozniak is coming to Georgia State University on January 30th for a uh, talk that is free and open to the public. Um, it's on a Wednesday. I believe it's at 12 PM. Um, it's in the afternoon, but I'm certainly going. Anybody else that would like to go, uh, please let us know. We'll probably put up just something on the forums uh, to try and get some cars together. I mean, this is Steve Wozniak. This is, this is pretty damn cool, especially considering that it's, uh, it's free to, for the public. Um, OK, secondly, uh, I emailed out about it, but just wanted to make another announcement. There are these guys that are doing exploit development workshops for free. Uh, they're just webinars. Um, so that's on the Gray Hat chat list right now, if you're looking for the URL to do so. Break this. Wait, break this? No. No, no. You're just bad with touch screen. No, no, no. Now it's flat. Oh, God. <laughs> OK, yeah, again, technical difficulties. Um, so this semester, we're tra changing things up a little bit. Um, as per your feedback and as per the discussions that the other admins and myself had uh, towards the end of last semester, uh, we decided that having three weekly meetings um, was a little bit much because we had our lab, we had the uh, competition training, and then we had the actual general meeting. Uh, we are reducing that to two meetings a week. We are going to be ha having our general meetings every Tuesday, 7.30 p.m. I believe this is the room that we are going to be meeting in um, every week, but that has not been confirmed yet. Okay, so uh, it would seem that it's open, but, but um, just keep your eyes on the mailing list um, for any updates uh, to that status. Um, another thing that we really took into account as per your feedback last semester was the content of these meetings. Um, last semester we had a whole lot of industry professionals come in, talk about the industry, talk about um, the organizations that they represented, and all that good stuff. Um, and, and people wanted to see more, some more tools. So as of right now, um, after we're done uh, sort of doing the announcements, we're going to go through all of the other admins and myself are going to go through a quick snippet of a tool that we have chosen um, just to give you a demonstration of it. Um, and in the following six weeks, each one of us is going to take a single presentation and do the whole um, time on that tool specifically. So you'll get a little taste of what we're going to be teaching um, for the next six weeks. And then uh, you know, during the next six weeks, you'll see more about it. Uh, we do have Conoco Phillips scheduled for the end of February. And PricewaterhouseCoopers would like to come back in. Stack and Lou would also like to come back in. Um, I think those were some of the best presentations we had last semester, so I don't see any reason why we shouldn't do that. Um, so that's that. Uh, elections. Elections are going to be happening at the end of February. Uh, I know that's not the end of the semester, but uh, basically what we want to do is we want to figure out who the administrative board is going to be come next fall. And we want to have them shadow the people that are currently in the positions for the remainder of the semester so that we can hopefully have a smooth transition. Uh, we've had a lot of really great progress over the past eight months. And we don't want to see that fail due to a bumpy transition. So um, for those of you that think you might uh, want to be in an administrative position, please run. Uh, we have something really good going here. I think we're losing half the admins. Myself, I will be gone. Alex will be gone as well. Jack, you? We'll be gone. So that's three, three out of six right there. And I haven't spoken with the other admins um, yet, but you know, they, they're by no means obligated to continue in their, in their positions if they don't see fit. So um, if you really like this organization, if you like what you've learned and, and seen, please consider uh, taking an active role in it. Um, it's, it's a whole hell of a lot of fun to be up here doing this sort of stuff uh, with you guys. Um, Some technical difficulties. What kind of technical difficulties? Blue ones. Blue ones. Well, blue ones are the best ones. Uh, OK, well, I'll just, I'll just keep running with this. This Thursday, we're going to do some recruitment, um, meaning that at about, I think, 6 PM, uh, myself and anybody else who's interested, we're going to meet in the Gray Hat Lab. 
We're going to print out some flyers, and we're going to go harass people and shove flyers in their face. Uh, judging by the turnout this week, we already have a really solid group, and we have a pretty damn full room. So uh, that might speak to whether or not we're going to be in this room for the future or for the rest of the semester. But last semester, we only had five people come out and do recruitment. We had 120 people in attendance the first week. So uh, that goes to show you the sort of impact that this can have. I know like recruiting isn't always the most fun thing to do. But if you guys just have the spare time, it's only going to take an hour. We're just going to go around, have fun, hang out with each other, and just put some flyers up. You know, Go to East Campus, go to West Campus, go through the College of Computing, all that good stuff. Um, so again, 6 p.m., Gray Hat Lab on Thursday if you guys want to participate. I only have like two more announcements, so you guys better. <laughs> uh, we're trying. No, we're trying. Uh, OK, so lastly, there are uh, two links that I will be sending out to the mailing list one of which is called Google Hard Code. And basically, it's a competition, sort of like their application development competitions, but it's focused on security, and there's actually monetary prizes at the end. So if you like developing secure software, oh, this is a hack. Uh, <coughs> if you like developing secure software and uh, you want to get a group together for this, then great. That would be awesome. Uh, the other thing is there are a sequence of exploit development tutorials that I was sent by one of our friends at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and post those as well. So should be some really good educational resources, so keep, uh, keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, otherwise, did any of the other admins want to make any announcements? You can totally say something about anything you'd like. So like, uh, if you haven't noticed, the mailing list has been getting a bit busy, especially with all the replies and stuff going on. So we're going to change it up a little bit, well, hopefully. So the admins and the select uh, number of people can actually send to the mailing list. And the people who want to reply can reply directly to the, uh, to the sender. And it will be a forum reply so everyone else can see it. And we're also hoping to have like a digest system up. So maybe every week it will send you a list of all the uh, popular forum threads that we've been having. So we're trying to, like, we know it's probably pretty annoying to have like 10 emails a day from Gray Hat. So we're going to try to minimize that. And if you, if you haven't been to the website in a while, uh, you should go check, because Eric's done a lot of really good work over the break with it. Um, yes, thank you for the successful handoff. There we go. OK, so who all came to labs last semester? I'm Alex, by the way. I'm the lab admin. OK, so we wanted to try to make labs more open. So um, labs are every other week. Obviously, we got the first lab starting next week. Um, we're going to try to make them more inclusive, some more kind of some stuff with collaboration. So if you came last semester and kind of felt left out. We're trying to, you know, kind of reform that and make everybody, you know, feel more as a part of a group. So come out and you know, we can open. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of probably the pizza. That's probably a good thing. Yeah, so everybody's like staring at the pizza. So why don't you come get some pizza? Uh, make, sure you, make sure you sign in. Good? Okay. Um, so what this is going to do uh, is it's going to try and connect to the server. And if you haven't connected to that server before, it's going to give you this thing, which says the authenticity of the host can't be established, all, all this stuff. Most people just say yes to this. Um, really what this is doing is it's uh, telling you what the public key of the server is. And that's not going to change as long as the server is the same server. Uh, if somebody was trying to eavesdrop on your connection or trying to put up a fake server, this number would change. Um, so what, what happens when you say yes to this, it adds it to your, uh, your list of known hosts. And after that, it won't prompt you. 
So if, if you ever normally communicate with the server and it gives you that prompt again, that's a sign that maybe someone is trying to trick you into logging to a different server. So normally this is just gonna give you a password, so I'm gonna put in the password. Um, and now I I'm, I'm, have a shell that's on the remote server and this is, I mean I guess it looks pretty similar, but I'm actually on a completely different machine right now. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, you can just run normal commands, you can look at all the stuff. Um, but that's not, that's the thing that people usually use SSH for. But there are a lot of really cool things you can use it for in addition to that. Um, so one thing you can do is the whole, you know, I had to type in a password to get in here. And it would be really nice if I didn't have to type a password. But you don't want to set up SSH without any passwords because that's not very secure. And anybody can just go in and log into your account and do whatever they want, which is a bad thing. But what you can do is you can use some cryptography techniques so that only your computer can log into the remote server and it can log in without a password. So what you have to do, so I, I just closed that connection. Um, what you can do is use this command called SSH keygen. Um, and when you type that, it's gonna generate a public-private key pair on your, your client. Um, and I just put normal stuff in here. I'm gonna use no password, passphrase for this. Uh, this stuff's not really that important. And what, it, what this really did is if you look in uh, your .ssh folder, you can see there are two new files called idrsa and idrsa.pub, and those are your private and public keys, respectively. Um, if you don't know what that means, this basically, this is a way for the, the server to understand who you are um, when you make a connection. Yeah, let me just, give me a second. That's probably a little better. Okay, so, uh, so this, this public key allows the server to know who you are, but it doesn't give, it doesn't allow them to encrypt messages directly. This is your private key, and that's what you use to encrypt messages to the send of the server. So if you have both of these, you can prove to the server that you are you, uh, and it can let you in. So what, what you need to do to set up with the server a connection where it's going to allow you to log in without a password is you need to put this public key file, um, you're gonna need to add it to the server's list of uh, authenticated keys. So to do that, um, we first need to copy the key to the remote host. So we can use this, there, there are a bunch of different ways to do this. There's SFTP, which is really just SSH with a little bit of a command line on top of it. Um, so we go to same, same thing. They had that no IP. There we go. Um, I use capital P for whatever reason, and in the other order for whatever reason. Um, these tools are not exactly the most consistent. So we still have to put our password in, but now we can put idrsa.pub. Um, and we copied it to the server, and now we can SSH back in. And we can move idrsa.pub to So now, now we've put that into our authorized key file. Uh, we didn't have any authorized keys before, so we didn't have to, we just overwrote it. But normally what you do is you would append it. Uh, so you do something like RSA, I guess we moved it. Um, but you would, you would take it and then you would append it to the end of the, the new file because your key just fits on a single line. So now what's gonna happen um, is we have to tell the client that it needs to use that key instead of just using the password because it doesn't know that it's supposed to try and authenticate like that. So this comes in with the other useful thing that you can do with SSH, um, which is .ssh slash config. Uh, and this lets you set a bunch of nice settings for different uh, servers that you're communicating with. So you notice that I had to type JS hackers, the username, and the port number, and all that stuff whenever I tried to authenticate to that particular server. Um, what you can do here is you can say um, something like this, and you can just give it a bunch of default information. Uh, so, so it's gonna default to user JS hacker, it's gonna default to port 10022, and it's going to uh, 
um, going to use the private key IDRSA. So now what I'll be able to do is SSH, and it instantly goes through because it knows it defaulted to that username, it defaulted to that port, and it used my special key that I put on the server uh, that allows me to get in with any, without any password. So all of these things can make your life a lot simpler uh, if you're trying to go onto a server like that. Uh, generally, though, you do want to add a password to your private key. Um, so I, I didn't put a password in when I generated that one. But if I had put a password in, it would still prompt me for a password. And what that's really doing is it's encrypting your private key on your, your local computer, uh, and then it will decrypt it before it uses it for the connection. So um, some people find this annoying that they have to decrypt the key every time. So there's this really useful uh, tool called SSH Agent. And what SSH Agent is gonna do is it's going to automatically, so you, you use SSH Agent and then you give it a list of private keys that you're using. And what it will do is it will decrypt those and store them in memory temporarily so that any time you try and connect to an SSH thing, it will use those keys, but those keys aren't accessible through the file system anymore. Um, so it's basically, it's a safe way of decrypting your keys once and then using them for the rest of your session until you either kill SSH agent with SSH agent-K SSH agent or you log out of your computer um, so you don't have to keep typing your password. So you can actually, you can do all this stuff and you can make SSH work really conveniently and without any passwords and it's kind of nice. So, there you go. Oh, you need a terminal? Okay. So, Yeah, do whatever you want. What are you doing? You can't see the presenter's face at this time. Um, oh, why is it? No, you have to. Is that good enough? Cool. <coughs> oh, yeah, right, microphone. <laughs> yeah, we have to configure all the computers. Yeah, there is. Tim, can you hear me? Cool. Oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. So, who in here has done any networking before? Who in here has no clue about networking? Who's heard of port scanning? Yeah. All right. So. Port scanning is, um, so every computer has 65536 6, ports. Um, it basically means that um, an address will, or an application will pick a port to listen on or bind to. That's what port it's talking over. Um, it's useful for, like, let's say, um, so you can have multiple things talking to the network on one time, and when you get packets back, you know that, oh, port 22 is, for example, SSH. Um, so port scanning is the art of, you know, trying to scan through firewalls, see what ports are actually open on what target machines. Um, so, for example, we're, I know that there's a couple machines logged into this. Um, so who's heard of NMAP? Cool. Um, so 
Nmap has a lot and a lot of features. So if you ever don't know what to do with Nmap, uh, just type Nmap and hit enter, and there's just a. Nick, how do you make this bigger? Cool, is that good? Um, okay, so um, I know that the IP range on this is 192.168.56, so I'm going to. So what I've done here is I basically instructed Nmap to just since like if I'm an outside attacker or whatever, I don't know what I you know what IPs are running, but for this I just want to figure out what's up and what's down so I can then not send so many packets to um, to the target network because if you do you might set off what's known as an intrusion detection system which you don't want. Um, so I'm going to run this and it should return. Shouldn't take too long. So the slash 24 means like the network part of that IP address is 24 bits long, so it's only scanning 256 hosts. Give host discovery. It skips host discovery. Oh. My bad. Uh, it's S capital P or S lowercase n, depending on what version you're using. Yeah, my bad. So this is the one that I wanted to do that should give me. So I have 56.1 and 56.101 that are up. Uh, I know 101 from past experience as a web server. Um, so let's say I want to find out more about that. Well, there's the dash A flag which does uh, host, host detect, detection and version detection, and the dash O, which is operating system detection. Um, A and O do that. Well, A and O do separate things. Uh, A is host detection um, and version. It's OS detection and version detection. Uh, Nick, could you? Oh, yeah, my bad. <laughs> wow. So sometimes this takes a while because it's throwing, when we tried it last time, it was somewhere on the order of 10,000 packets at, uh, a, at a single host to try to figure out. So it basically sends back you know, slightly malformed packets to see what happens because all the um, stacks, the, the networking stacks of everything are implemented slightly differently in every operating system. Um, and then there's other things like port scanning options. You can, since there's, uh, who's heard of TCP and UDP? Okay, here we go. So no exact OS matches, but if you see at the bottom, it says, um, please report. There's a way to report to Nmap what you just copy this fingerprint, I did it before, um, and you tell them like, oh, this is Ubuntu 12.04 running in a virtual machine, and they'll update their services. So eventually that this will be like, oh yeah, this is Ubuntu uh, 12.04 server. Um, so there's other options like timing options. Let's say you're scanning a large group of uh, hosts and you want to do it really quickly. Um, so there's, There's uh, six different timing options, T0 through T6. Um, sorry, T0 through T5. Uh, T5 is the fastest one. T0 is ridiculously slow. Um, so I did that in 0.171 seconds, for those of you who can't see. If I put T0 on there, it takes a lot longer. Um, and there's, there's certain things for, um, what about what? Stealth, you would want to scale back your timing. So if you want to go undetected, you're going to want to, I didn't grab it here because I thought I'd be spending more time on networks, but um, you basically want it, there's an option where you can randomize which hosts uh, to do in a different network that'll help 
not get you caught when you're scanning. So it takes obviously longer than uh, 1.71 seconds to do that scan on T0. Um, I think it's everything. Who's next? Um, yeah, this is, I'll change your SSH. My, unless they got HDMI. HDMI? I'm not HDMI, I'm a DVI. DVI is what I use on my laptop. I don't think. Okay. Probably will make things interesting. Yes. Oh, that's not going to work. Yeah? PGI? Oh, yeah. Because, you know, Windows stuff, it's hard to show GUI stuff. Half of it is over SSH, the other half is actually visual. But I might already have a screen over here. Which means it could be me. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Okay. Do you need a computer? You need a computer. Back in the windows. I'm trying to get out of the black screen that it's decided I belong in. Black screen, that is good. Okay, so um, who's ever heard? Of, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's black screen. Uh, I bet we're going to have so much feedback on this thing. Okay, so uh, who here has heard of a web proxy before? And that's sort of an overloaded term, um, but in the sense of what I'm about to demonstrate, uh, to, to really grasp why this is important, uh, we might have to defer that to when I actually do a full presentation on this. But basically, when you submit a request, when I type in greyhat.gatech.edu, that request goes off port 80, off to uh, the server located at greyhat.gatech.edu, hits it, and comes right back. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, there's some situations in which you want to intercept your own traffic and modify it on the wire. Um, and that's, that's where our proxy comes into play. Uh, there's a bunch of different proxies that you can get 
Um, burp is one that we have looked at uh, in meetings before. One that I have recently uh, become accustomed to and actually really enjoy is called Peros. It's also uh, written in Java, so I'm going to go ahead and pull it up. Uh, and for some reason, it doesn't really get my class path, but that's okay. Okay, so this is Paros. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. When you pop it up, it uh, starts a proxy running on port 8080. So basically what you want to do is you want to direct your HTTP traffic onto port 8080. Once you do that, it's going to be intercepted by Paros. And then basically you can have Paros trap requests and responses, and you can modify them in flight and then send them along. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, go up here to trap. I'm going to go to trap request and trap response. And then I'm going to go into my browser here. And uh, depending on the browser that you use, there's different ways that you set this up. Um, if you use Chrome, which you should be doing, uh, this is the way that you do this. You go to change proxy settings. You go to LAN settings. And then I say that I'm running a proxy on 127.0.0.1, which re redirects back to my local host. And I specify port 8080. So now, when I hit OK, OK, if I go to, let's say, this is my own personal website, notice how it's not serving me a web page. And notice how there's this nice blinking icon down here in the bottom. So you see, this is the request that just happened. When I just hit Enter, this is basically what was sent to the server at morecodeplease.com. Um, just, for, just for the heck of it, I'm just going to not trap these, and I'm going to hit continue. And so this is, this is one of the things that I really like about this. Because basically, when you're dealing with burp, um, you can sort of handle requests as they come and go, but I haven't seen any functionality like this. So all of the HTTP requests, I mean, my initial page was served. I have some Twitter stuff on there. I have some JavaScript stuff that I'm using. I have Google Analytics and all that. And you can see that just that single, uh, that single request actually pulled stuff down from all of these sites. Um, and I can dig down in here. Uh, and so this is the site that I was initially checking out. And it sort of shows the directory structure of what it's found of the site that you're requesting, um, which is, is really cool. Uh, one of the things that you might want to do with this. So who here has uploaded a file before on a website? Everybody, fantastic. Well, maybe not some of you, but hopefully everybody. Uh, so the, for those of you that have done uh, web development before, you know that there is an upload HTML tag, which basically you just put an upload tag in there, and it gives you the browse button, and it gives you the file, uh, the file descriptor and stuff like that. That's automatically built into the browser. As far as I know, I could be wrong. Maybe, maybe you roll your own um, upload functionality, but basically when you upload a file, it specifies the file name for you. Okay? So when I upload mypuppies.png or something like that to my website, because I want to show pictures of puppies, uh, it's automatically going to have mypuppies.png as the file name. Now, if I'm a web developer and I don't know that there's devious people out there that can modify that in flight, I'm probably not going to validate the file name, am I? Uh, so if I don't validate the file name, that's a potential attack vector. I could basically capture a request in flight, modify uh, the file name of, in the HTTP request, and that will get propagated to the server. So it's basically a false sense of security that's given to the developer just by, uh, by this functionality. Hold on one second, Robert. Uh, so that's, uh, th there's lots of things you can do with this. I'm going to explore uh, or basically demonstrate a lot more of them. Um, when I have a whole period to do this. But just to show you some additional functionality, which I believe Eric is going to expand on with a more dedicated tool, one of the things you can do with, uh, with this is spider a website. So if I hit spider and then hit start, it's crawling my own website right now. Uh, and this isn't just using pulling down the initial page and then looking for additional URLs that are in the, under the same domain and then requesting those. It actually has a library of uh, common file names. So, you know, there's, uh, 
whether it's something.cgi, the setup.cgi. But the, the, yeah, there's basically, depending on what the web server is, depending on what the operating system is, depending on, depending on what modules are installed and things like that, there will be different default files that are put in certain places. And so it's also testing for those, even if it hasn't found anything linking to them. Um, so this is just going to take uh, an extra few seconds. But what you can see over here, this is really cool. This is actually uh, basically black box testing my website to see what the directory structure is like. Um, in addition to this, there's also a scan functionality that will look through all of it. It'll check for SQL injection holes. It will check for directory traversal uh, uh, holes. It will check for all sorts of stuff, and it actually builds a report. Not only does it build a report, but it tells you how to fix these vulnerabilities as well. So not only is this a tool that you can use for offensive security, this is a tool that you can use for defensive security. <coughs> so um, again, uh, if, if this doesn't seem like that cool of a tool, if it doesn't seem like you could use this for all that much, um, please hold your enthusiasm for when I'm able to really show you how this thing works. When, it, when, I, when I show you the possibilities of this, you're, you're going to freak. I promise you. Um, does anybody have any questions? I know Robert did. You don't even need to do the manipulation because on Linux you're allowed to have like new lines, quote marks, semicolons, and stuff in your file names. The only thing I believe you actually have to manipulate your request for is null characters. So, uh, for instance, one of the things that you probably would really want to do is uh, maybe a PHP executable string. So open caret question mark PHP space shell exec base64 decode get dollar sign all that stuff. Okay. So if you're running on Linux, then you can potentially do that. Uh, point in case though, the entire point of a proxy is that you can modify things in transit. Uh, yeah. So, and it's done. Um, so we can see uh, these are all the pages. And I actually found out that there is a bunch of stuff that you can pull down from my site that I didn't actually know about. So I'm going to spend some of tonight looking at those. There's no uh, really vulnerable stuff, so I'd appreciate it if you didn't even try. But knowing, knowing how, how this group operates, I'm sure that might fall upon some deaf ears. Uh, OK, so are you ready to go, Jack? All right. Thank you very much. My video there? The, the pink? Yes. Should be white. So, yeah, see, I told you that should be white. <laughs> so, social engineering toolkit. Social Engineering's Toolkit, it's a command line utility, like many things. You get it from uh, one of these places. Trusted Sec makes it. I think I put it. There it goes. So it's manufactured by Trusted Security. You get it, just download it from their site. For, on package it, you have to have, it runs up based on Metasploit, so it's back in by Metasploit. A lot of the vulnerabilities and stuff packages are made by Metasploit. Um, we go in. So this is a, I think, configured copy. I've been trying to figure out where I'm missing configuration. Uh, pseudo. Oh, why am I in there? So set, 
see social media hook it. There's a lot, a lot of options, and you can spend a lot of time actually exploring it. One of the some of the bigger things using it is um, it does everything from spear phishing, website infection, media payloads, um, PowerShell, um, spoofing Wi-Fi access points to try to pull people's traffic through you. What? QR code, you've seen those scan codes for cell phones? That's an attack vector based upon that. You can attack people that. Phones also have known vulnerabilities. We can target phones. So there's a lot of tools here. Um, let's pick something random off the list. Yeah, Arduino. You can actually, it'll actually take an Arduino and program the Arduino. So when you plug in a computer, it actually does the attack. Um, uh, let's try to make a website attack vector. As you can tell, it's very prompt oriented. Gives you a lot of information. So, um, where am I? Number one, Java applet. I don't have Java installed on the target machine. That's not going to work out well. Yeah, I'm man left in the middle. That's web jacking six. It's, I'm trying to read it off of here. It gets a little bit hard because I should actually clone it. Better. Because now I can see what I'm doing actually. So site cloner. IP address for the post back in the harvester trace back. That's me. It's hard to move it up. Then you won't be able to read everything. It gets really hard to read when I make it smaller. That high enough? OK. Enter the URL to clone. OK. I think I've erased everything. Uh, Facebook.com. The best way to use this attack is using your password fields are available. Um, do you want to attempt to disable Apache? Yes. Stop Apache. <coughs> oh, no, I'm using the address. Um, let me see. What? Sudo etc slash um, init d slash Stopped. Okay, the Apache server should be down. So I'm going to go through web jacking, clone. Facebook.com. Oh, IP address. 143.215.204.76. Face. HTTP. Yeah. That's fully qualified and works. What's on 80 on me? I just turned off Facebook Apache. No, Apache, something's eating my 80. So, what? Yeah. This is what Netstat looks like. Notice how pretty it is. It's going to be really pretty. But remember, it's dash P. I don't see anything on 80. It's seeing things. <laughs> now it's time to start another one. Well, Obviously, it's time just to start a new computer, because that's why I roll. What do you mean? You don't start new computers on the fly? It's 
switching to my local box. If this, I don't, I didn't, I didn't plan on doing ADS, doing other things with it, but if we're cloning Facebook, I can do it with this. What? This is whatever backtrack I've had on here forever. And that's Vista. Because everyone needs a copy of Vista. <laughs> you mean you don't have a copy of 32-bit Vista running on your machine? XV? <laughs> See, I tried to get XP, but Dream DreamSpark was down. So Backtrack 5 also comes with the set. That's the other way to get it, is just install Backtrack 5. I actually use this computer too. Checking the PDF is very fun. I have all sorts of things like checking on here. And now I've moved to three operating systems on the same machine. I keep. Uh, it's. I'm running three OS's now. <laughs> it's starting to slow down slightly. That's why I didn't want to run Backtrack in addition to all of this. So Backtrack on here, three OS's at the same time, yes. Social engineering tools and exploitation tools, social engineering toolkit. What did I do? 99. 99. 1, 2, 6, 2. I need to put this thing in. I am at. I don't know my ID. Yeah. <laughs> it's loading. <laughs> See, it actually bothers to tell you. It's that one. The best way, yes. All right, so I've got a site up here, port 80. This for this machine. This big, when you're running on Backtrack, this is why it's not so much fun. This machine is running on 15. Why is it pizza grease? All right, so we know what's. So we're going to go back into VirtualBox here. Settings. So what if we should now have to forward port 80 from my main machine to the machine that we're trying to that's holding the exploit? So it's another runaround. Port forwarding. So 1.15. So see, I've got the rule set up here for TCP forwarding. Except I'm not that host IP. I am now you. So when I go to me,
Okay. Uh, hey, look, it's me, and I put my real password in. Who would have ever thought I'd do such a thing? Oh, yeah. Also, <laughs> so there it pulls a password and username for Facebook. Now excuse me while my Facebook changes slightly very, very quickly. <laughs> and this Facebook this actually the, is, has a unique password on my password set, so I really don't care. You aren't going to log in anything else with this one. So that's set. Set has a lot of th quick throw utilities like that. The one I was going to throw was an email vector attack, but I didn't expect to have to have port 80 clean. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can keep going and going and going. The, now, one of the cool things when you get into it is you have to start writing your own exploits that get used inside of it. That way, the exploits work. The web stuff always works because you see it just does that. It's not like a scanner is going to go, hey, your web stuff isn't working anymore. <laughs> I'm going to get mine out because it's big. But you can start that when you go into um, this stuff, you can start to filter out. What? Well, because so right now it, the, the whole at the end it was like, oh, username cut on password cut, right? Mm -hmm. So I understand the password thing because that's the attribute on the input page. But how does it? By, by it's the, not pulling what it's pulling for where it's getting user and password. Those are actual field names. Those are those are actual. Those aren't the, those are field names. So variable name. I'm loading. <laughs> No, I haven't. It just started. And I don't know.
Okay, I'm doing a quick run through of Wireshark. Uh, I'm going to start this real quick. Uh, don't want whatever that was. Then uh, I have really fast PowerPoint. It's completely legitimate, I promise. I promise. Okay, super short PowerPoint. <laughs> I don't know why it's running really slow. Okay, Wireshark's network packet analyzer means it tries to grab everything from the network that it can and then display it all for us. Uh, it's used for troubleshooting networks, examining security problems, debugging protocol implementations, and learning network protocols. Uh, useful stuff with it, you, it's kind of helpful if you know MAC addresses, IPv4 addresses, and TCP and UDP. Okay, that's the end. Really short PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why Wireshark is refusing to open. I'll tap. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, wait. It might help if I. Log in real quick. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, I. There it is. Yay, Wireshark. Okay. So, I started capturing stuff, just network on uh, GT Ether, which isn't very secure, so you can get stuff. Uh, so, it's a lot of stuff right now. Uh, 6,400 packets. Kind of a lot. So, we can do some analyzing stuff. Uh, oops, or statistics. We can go to, like, HTTP. Uh, or, we can view IP addresses. I don't really care about filters right now. just want to see everything. These are all the IPs being used or used during this time. There's a lot. Am I on there? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what are they? Check out what they're doing. Let's find out what they're doing. <laughs> Uh, we have the ability. <laughs> Which one was it? Filter. Red filter first. Okay. Uh, crap. What was the IP? Oh, come on. <laughs> 105. It's, uh, it's not typing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. Okay. I don't know why. Yay, Torrance. Then we can follow the stream. Uh, UPNP. Yeah, so I guess that makes sense for everything that's using plug and play now. So everything would be trying to connect to that. 
So there's a lot of computers using it. Uh, oh, UPnP. Uh, so we don't really need that anymore. <laughs> uh, what? Where? Oh, statistics. Oh. Okay, I haven't used this one. <laughs> Oh. So, lots of stuff. Most of it looks to be UDP. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the 57%. Uh, I don't see anything interesting. What? Where? Oh, there? Yeah, what he said. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, I can't, like, click on anything. Okay. Uh, let's see. What? Yeah, this is Wireshark. There's lots of things you can do. Capture things. Uh, you can see IP destinations, too. You can see where they're going. This one? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'll go ahead and let Eric take over, and we can do our last one, because we are kind of running over. I'm on back charge. So, um, slight technical difficulties with the last presentation. We're going to go ahead and defer that to, um, you can actually, so, so the last thing that we were going to show was basically a, a CMS scanning tool. Um, Eric was, uh, yeah, Word, WordPress, um, which basically, so, so has anybody used like WordPress or Joomla or Drupal or any of that stuff before? Yeah, so basically it's a way to take a website and throw it up as quickly as possible and make it look pretty good. Um, for those of you that have seen web development projects before, uh, how good is it their security generally? <laughs> Terrible. It's absolutely awful. Um, and generally, people don't keep them updated either. Uh, some of them support automated updating at this point. Many of them do not. So when you have CMS scanning tools, you can basically point it at a site. It'll know all of the vulnerabilities that have been reported in the past for the CMS tool, and it will look through the site to find them. Um, so we'll go ahead and demonstrate that uh, at the beginning of next week. Um, thank you all so much for dealing with our uh, technical difficulties. We will definitely get smoother as, as uh, the semester goes on. Um, I'm, I'm really excited for the video recording part. Uh, 
so we currently have six talks planned between myself and the other admins. Uh, we have two, two or three talks planned through external organizations, PricewaterhouseCoopers, ConocoPhillips, and uh, Stack and Lou, uh, who are now known as Bishop Fox. Um, but that still leaves a handful of weeks open. So um, when, I, when I initially spoke with the other admins about what we were going to be showing today, uh, they, they, they didn't all know about the tools that they were going to be demonstrating. Some of them did, but some of them did not know about the tools that they were going to be demonstrating. Uh, this just goes to show that even if you don't know about a tool, one of the best ways to learn about the tool is to dedicate yourself to a presentation, learn about it, and show it to us. Um, so if there's a tool that you want to know, know about, you can either put it up in the forums, uh, send it out to the email list, see if somebody else can give a presentation for it, or you can give a presentation on it on your own, have yourself go into the archives, and years from now, people will be watching these videos, educating themselves about the field of information security from your talk. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that's a great incentive. I think this is a great organization. I'm thrilled with the um, turnout that we have today. I mean, uh, this, this, this is the first week we haven't even done any recruiting. Again, recruiting this Thursday, 6 p.m., Gray Hat Lab. Um, there's plenty of pizza left up here. Thank you guys for coming. It's going to be a great semester, and uh, we'll see you all next week. And if anybody actually is going to bother to dare try to set up Social Engineering Toolkit, let me know so I can yeah. tell you actually how to write the config file. Yeah, there you go. <laughs>